We're right at the very end of uh, policy gradients. And last time we sort of ended with this uh, A3C architecture, the picture. Um, basically, this was a very simple uh, actor critic algorithm, pretty standard actor critic algorithm. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that they try to exploit asynchronous learning. So they had these multiple workers um, that were all updating a centralized network. And, and this, this allowed them to do a lot more exploration uh, than they could do otherwise. And the thing that you know, is really going to change from application to application is what this uh, network is going to look like, or, or how, how are you going to represent the policy and the value function. And so we're going to look at just a uh, couple of standard ways, which you've basically seen before, um, at least one of them, for, for representing policies. And the value functions, they'll usually just use a standard neural network um, to, you know, basically the value function is just a number. So you just have one you know, regression node here that uh, returns a number and you use least, least uh, the mean squared error uh, as the loss function. So talked about some tricks. So if you have discrete action spaces, uh, things are fairly straightforward. Uh, so you would uh, remember we have to have a, a probabilistic policy here. And so for those of you who have done uh, deep learning, use neural networks for classification, uh, you, you might recognize the softmax layer, uh, which is just you have one node for every action or every choice. And it, uh, you return a probability um, over those nodes, uh, so a probability distribution. And we've called that previously in this course a uh, Boltzmann distribution. And so what you would do is you have the neural network represent this H function. Right? It might have one node for every action in the output layer, like we saw for Atari, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and then you're just putting it, you're just normalizing it according to this exponential. So this is a pretty standard thing. Um, you know, this would be, if it's a linear function here, the parameters would be the thetas. A neural network is just a deep, uh, you know, basically a, a series of these functions with nonlinearities between them uh, with lots more parameters. So uh, for continuous space, so, so first, any questions about the discrete space? You know, this is basically what we saw for Atari. Um, you just have one node in the output for every action, and there you have it. So continuous spaces may not be as obvious to people, but, but this, is, this is a typical thing that's done. So, uh, so in robotics, uh, for example, you, you might want to have real-valued uh, actions and in particular, a real-valued action vector that uh, might control the actuator uh, current sent to, the, uh, to the, the actuator. And those would be represented by um, some number of real numbers. And remember, we want to have a uh, probabilistic policy. And so what is typically done is you'll have the neural network or whatever functional form you're using uh, require, uh, take the state as input, and it will output, um, if you have uh, D action variables, uh, D actuators in the robotics case, you would have D outputs here, um, these Vs, and those would be treated as the mean of a Gaussian distribution. Right? So you have the neural network output the mean of a Gaussian distribution, and then the, pro the policy is... Uh, treated as probabilistic by first generating that mean and then sampling an action according to the Gaussian distribution with uh, that mean and either a hand-specified variance or you can also learn this variance. So, so you can uh, backpropagate uh, everything uh, through either just the mean variables or, or the variance variables. Um, and, you know, depending on yeah, who you ask, they, they may like to set these by hand, the variance parameters, or, or not. So that's, that's typically how uh, things are done when you have a continuous space. Um, so any questions about that? <laughs> 
And you'll you'll come across continuous spaces, and a, a lot of a lot of traditional control tasks are just inherently continuous. That's where control literature actually started out. Um, they usually would would have sort of nice linear control systems, and they could derive you know, what the what the optimal controllers would be. But uh, but now 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 the systems are much more complicated. You can't can't get an optimal controller, and and this is yeah, a common thing to be doing. All right. So, a couple of examples. I don't have a video of this, but you could probably look. So, so early on in policy, this is actually pretty old results. Um, early on, one of the uh, claims to fame for policy gradient methods was uh, controlling these helicopters. Uh, these, it's just a remote control helicopter, and they uh, they were able. It, these helicopters are hard to control because it's a highly nonlinear system. Uh, and this is one thing you can do. You can actually make a helicopter fly upside down. So I, I never knew this until I saw this picture, but you can do that. And uh, I, think, I think here they, they didn't actually learn the maneuver to make it flip over. So it was more, uh, you know, a human got it to flip over and then it, then it flew in an automated way. Uh, but, but they learned this with reinforcement learning, and, and you might wonder how they actually did that, because it seems a little dangerous to be doing policy gradient with a real helicopter. Right? So they, they obviously did not do that, right? Because you would go through a lot of helicopters. So, so what they did is, <laughs> really, so, so this is a really good example of, uh, you know, what you, you know, the limitations of reinforcement learning in, in the real world, right? You can't explore... Uh, remember, uh, when we started reinforcement learning, I said there can't be any dead ends to have any sort of guarantees or, or any quality assurance. And yeah, helicopter flight has dead ends. Like, it's a crash. So, so uh, what they did is they uh, basically flew the helicopter a lot by hand, manually, and learned a dynamics model of the, uh, the helicopter. And so it was kind of model-based in, in that sense, but, but it was sort of a uh, local dynamics model around the region that they're planning to uh, sort of control. And then, uh, then they would use simulation to train the, uh, the policy. And then I guess they were lucky enough that they, they put it on the real helicopter and it worked. Right? There's no, no guarantee that that would happen. And, and so I'm sure, yeah, the, the first experiments there were quite exciting. And you know, who knows, they might've had crashes but they, they certainly had somebody right there to try to take over in case something uh, messed up. So, so this, this would be an example of a sort of simulation to real uh, transfer. That's often what it's referred to now. Where here they, they learned the, uh, the dynamics model uh, and then used it as a simulator. Sometimes you just have a physical simulator that you could use and, and you hope that, that it, it's good enough to transfer to the real world. So, so that was a nice example, and they, they did lots of uh, acrobatics. And you know, the, the claim to fame here was that they, they were able to handle a lot of cases that classical control algorithms weren't able to handle. Um, a lot of work on legged robots um, now, especially quad pre uh, the, the, the quadrupeds. Uh, and so this is just one, one picture of something that they would do. I think this was from Drew Bagnell's group. Um, they, I think some of these folks use pretty simple techniques for training these. Like they would just use the empirical gradient technique, but uh, with a very constrained control space. So you have just a small number of parameters that you're you're trying to control, trying to trying to learn. And so they would just set up a system where they could take the robot and put it at this end and have it try to walk over, you know, these terrains and they'd measure the speed or if it got to the other side. And that would be the reward signal. Like you want to get to the other side as quickly as possible. And uh, then they were just, uh, yeah, if you have a small enough parameter space, you can actually do something like empirical gradient descent. Um, you know, if you have enough time in the day to sort of keep moving the robot back and forth. So they, they apparently had that set up uh, so they could do it efficiently enough. And of course you can do this in parallel if you have multiple robots as well. So this is used quite a bit uh, in, I should, should have some videos of, of Cassie. So, so we're uh, uh, Jonathan Hurst uh, robot Cassie, uh, if you've ever seen the biped. Have, 
have you seen Cassie, this biped robot that, that Jonathan Hurst has, uh, has developed? Well, there, there's a group of students, some of them up there, that, that work on using policy gradient for, uh, for Cassie. And, and you start by learning in simulation. And in fact, we use one of these trust region type of algorithms right now. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, there's a lot of other choices to look at, but PPO is the algorithm that they're currently using. Train in simulation, and then they're able to actually get that to transfer to the treadmill, the robot, real robot on the treadmill. Um, it's been quite a period of time to get to that point. Uh, it, there's a lot of, you know, at first there's a lot of problems, you know, there might be little bugs in the simulator, or the controller, um, but they eventually got to the point where they can transfer reasonably well. Um, I think the limitations of that are still unclear, like how, how, how well they, you can transfer, um, you know, what the degree of transfer will be, but, but it looks pretty promising. Um, and so that's another example of, of using this for leg locomotion. Um, this is, you know, this is another, another interesting example from, uh, this is my research from way back. Um, we, we were trying to, uh, this, was, this is an area called proactive security. So you're trying to like, find security vulnerabilities or, or weaknesses in a network before the, the attacker does. And so, uh, so this was back in the, the day, well, I guess botnets <clears throat> are still a thing nowadays, but this was uh, back when botnets were sort of first coming out with you know, denial of service attacks and uh, Basically, there was a question of, you know, how should you really configure your network so it's not uh, as susceptible to these types of attacks. And so what we did is we, we created this uh, software that would, would simulate a botnet uh, attacking a particular mm -hmm. network, trying to do a distributed denial of the service attack. And so the botnet has, you know, what, anywhere from, you know, hundreds to thousands of of these nodes that have been taken over, and they can uh, communicate, ba basically send messages um, for the denial of service attack to any one of these uh, computers in the network that you're trying to attack. And uh, the reward function for this botnet was basically, um, you know, how many, you know, so, so the objective would be to maximize damage however you want to define damage. And damage could be like, you know, the, uh, the amount of traffic that, that you inject into this network or whether you take a particular node offline. Uh, so, so there's a lot of ways that you could define damage, but however you define it, this can be viewed as a reinforcement learning problem because we're, we're doing this in simulation sort of for the purpose of somebody configuring a network to try to sort of minimize uh, the potential for attack. So, so you configure your network and then you run this thing, you have it try to maximally damage your network, and then you might be able to see ways to adjust uh, the configuration so that the max damage could be smaller. So that's sort of the, the use case. Um, and th this was actually a, this was a high dimensional action space, right? Because basically every one of these nodes in the botnet, uh, the way we modeled it was they had a probability distribution over uh, the nodes in the network, which could be hundreds or thousands, uh, that they are going to send packets to. Um, and so, uh, so basically it's a resource allocation problem. You've got some traffic resources here and you're allocating it across the network. So high dimensional action space. And it, it just turned out that if you wrote this down and did some math, you could get a nice policy gradient algorithm out of it. Because uh, the, you know, the, the nice thing about this, all, all you have to do for, to use a policy gradient algorithm is you've got to be able to compute the, that score function, which is you know, how do I adjust the parameters so that it increases the, the probability of a certain action. And, and that turned out to be nice and easy in this case. Um, and then, yeah, there was also a, a, an easy sampling uh, routine from the policy representation. So we, uh, yeah, we studied that and we were able to show, well, you can get some pretty good attacks, you know, much better than if you just try to randomly attack, um, attack these networks. So yeah, there's lots of other examples out there, um, but uh, 
But uh, you know, just to recap, um, you know, policy gradient. Uh, you know, one motivation is when you, know, you think that policies may just be inherently easier to represent than Q functions, right? That's uh, a sort of an intuitive thing. And so why don't we just try to directly learn policies as opposed to trying to learn these more complicated objects, uh, you know, Q functions. And uh, uh, we, we found that, uh, uh, yeah, so, so basically uh, it also kind of lets you insert your, your knowledge about maybe the form of the, uh, the controller that you think you might want. Uh, you know, when, when it's a neural network, uh, you, uh, or if it's images you're dealing with, you might want comp, uh, convolutional uh, layers, um, or you could just have a very constrained form. So on that legged robotic example that I showed you with that, that four-legged robot, they just had sort of, a, sort of a standard parameterized, you know, from the factory policy uh, controller that, that with a small number of parameters that, that they, they were just working with directly. So that was that was really just a uh, you know almost a almost a human defined form, but but with some parameters, and, and you could still use these techniques. Um, yeah, basically the policy gradient theorem was sort of the key thing for, for all of these algorithms that we developed, and all all the algorithms basically just said, okay, here's a policy gradient theorem. Uh, how do we approximate the different pieces of it? And in particular, the, the Q function in that theorem was the key thing. Um, and eventually that led to actor critic methods, which if you are looking at the state of the art in policy gradient methods, they're going to be variants of actor critic, usually with some sort of trust region addition and, and various other bells and whistles uh, added on. But uh, Basically, with this, you can go out and read pretty much any paper on policy gradient, and it may, it may take you a couple passes through, but, but very quickly you'll get so, yeah, you, you can just understand these things very quickly because they're all pretty much derived from the same ideas. Right? So, so any questions? Right, that, that's pretty much it for policy gradient. And you know, this, this is pretty much uh, the state of the art in RL. Um, uh, as far as uh, model free goes, um, I still have a lot of hopes that that model uh, that, that the uh, well first uh, I, I tend to prefer uh, value function based approaches myself. Uh, so so I, I prefer things like Q learning, like DQN over over some of these. But uh, but sometimes you know, DQN can be difficult to apply um, in in a lot of situations. But I still hold out hope that those approaches will be better at the end of the day. Um, and and ma mainly it's just experience trying to train these things. You know, policy gradient, it's like controlling a wild animal. That's how I always describe it. And, uh, so what, once you once you figured out how to get it to train in a particular problem domain, like in Cassie, you know, it probably took us nine months to figure out how to get PPO to work for Cassie. And after that, you can sort of stay around that area, but if you change something significantly, it could all you know, crash again. And, uh, and then you're trying to figure out and diagnose what, what, what's going to make it work. Um, there's a value-based methods. It, it always feels like you can learn something, right? You can always, because uh, they're basically just trying to uh, back up the value function. So every experience, you know, you're trying to get self-consistent. Um, and, and we know that if you get a self-consistent value function, it's going to it's, it's going to satisfy the Bellman equation, and you're going to be okay. So, uh, or as policy gradient, if you get into a bad part of the parameter space, there's just nothing that you can learn that's useful. So, so we'll see um, how that all goes. But uh, yeah, that's all we have for policy gradient. Um, all right. So the next part. So, so I wanted to sort of follow policy gradient with uh, a section on, this is a pretty practical uh, section on if, if you just have a problem and you want to get something running uh, and you have some uh, information about how to solve the problem, but you want to automate that. Uh, and this is, this is an area called imitation learning and it's a useful thing to know um, 
because uh, you, you will run into situations where this is relevant quite often and it's a, sort of a low hanging fruit place to start. And sometimes you'll apply this type of idea, imitation learning, which is more like supervised learning, like traditional supervised learning. Um, and then you'll sort of use that as a bootstrapping technique uh, that you can then run reinforcement learning from. So, so sometimes imitation learning is, is, is a great way to get bootstrapped and then you can, can learn from there. Um, sometimes it's, it's uh, sufficient on its own. So let, let's see what imitation learning is. So it sort of, sort of starts out from uh, thinking about one-shot decision-making. So this is a regression or classification, right? So this, this is a classification task. Uh, you're shown an image and you're asked whether it's a cat or a dog or some other category, right? So it's, it's one shot in the sense that the decision that we're gonna make right now doesn't depend on really the history or, or the, the future that we're gonna experience, unlike a game. So, and, and likewise, regression would be you're predicting a number. That, that again, it uh, doesn't depend on the history of what you've seen in the past or, or the future in terms of, uh, you, you don't have to think about, oh, I'm making this move now because in the future, I'm gonna make this other move. This, the decisions are independent. So, so we've, uh, we've got a lot of techniques. So if you take uh, the basic machine learning course uh, or deep learning, uh, you're gonna spend most of your time learning about basic classification and regression. Uh, and, you know, there may be a few other problems that you look at like clustering or, or uh, autoencoding, but, uh, but you know, the bread and butter of those techniques are supervised learning for, for regression and classification. And the, here's just you know, a, a subset of the many algorithms that you could possibly use. You know, and well, here's, here's your neural networks um, that, that's, that, that are very popular nowadays, but You've got a lot of really other pow very powerful techniques. Random forests are really good to use if you sort of have your data featureized already, which is not terribly uncommon in, in a lot of real world applications. Uh, so, so we have a lot of these tools and, and one way I think about imitation learning is uh, we're trying to, trying to leverage these tools for, for classification and regression uh, for the purpose of control. Right? Uh, so we wanna, wanna leverage all the work that's been done in theory and, and software to, to apply these to control. And it's actually pretty straightforward um, at the end of the day. Uh, so, so if we think about policies, you know, what, what is a policy? It's a mapping from some input to an action, right? So in this case, we're mapping from, well, the input is you know, W previous frames of an Atari game. And we're, we're you know, producing one of you know 18 different uh, actions and if we think of these as classes right so so the first class is up plus pressing the button and the last class is left plus no button uh, then this is really just a classifier right it's classifying the input frames to an action uh, where the actions are the classes and uh, since we uh, have a lot of tools for learning classifiers, we might as well try to apply those to learn this policy somehow, All right? So that's, that's one example. And then the other example that we just saw was uh, from robotics uh, where, where policies can be regression functions or regressors. And uh, this is when we output something like a motor torque, right? And so, so uh, this is another example of where our Final policy is just a regressor, and so we should try to leverage uh, regressor learning algorithms or regression learning algorithms. All right, so so the uh, the basic idea is really straightforward, um, uh, you know, extremely straightforward. It's what you would do if uh, you know I, I didn't teach you anything, and and I said try to try to get a you know, try to get a uh, policy to drive a car, right? If you didn't take any courses in anything, well, you might, and you knew a little bit about machine learning, maybe you would uh, have somebody drive a car for a lot of, uh, you know, a long time through a lot of environments. You would capture the data of what the person was doing when driving the car, and you would try to learn 
a classifier or a regression function that mimics what the human did, right? That imitates or mimics. Um, and that's really all imitation learning is. And, uh, and we're, we're going to learn a little bit about where it can go wrong and how you can try to correct it a little bit. But, but at the end of the day, it's sort of the natural thing that you would do if you already have uh, a system like a human that can perform the task, but you want to automate it. Uh, this, is, this is where you do that. So, so this notation, so, so we, we have policy pi, and we're, we're going to use rho again to, to represent the long-term expected value of pi. Um, and again, we'll assume there's a single initial state, so you just start at an initial state, and then you run the policy. It's all the same if you assume a distribution over initial states. Uh, this is well-defined. Um, and... We want a high quality quality policy. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, talk about imitation learning here, and later on we're going to talk about uh, some other approach, which is, is similar. Uh, it, it leverages uh, classification and regression algorithms as well, uh, but it's a little more complicated. Um, so here um, we're going to assume that we have an expert that we can observe for the task, right? But, uh, but we want to kind of replace the expert. And we'll, we'll talk about a couple of different types of experts that you might come across as we go ahead. So, so the basic idea, as I said, is simple. So we, we're going to say that our expert corresponds to a, a policy called pi star. And pi star, we usually use star for optimal, but, but here it just means the expert. That's sort of the target policy. And so we're going to consider it to be, we're going to consider ourselves successful if we can do just as well as the expert at the end of learning, uh, which could be, could be mediocre or it could be close to optimal. Um, but, uh, but if we're learning from an expert, we can't really be expected to do much better than the expert, unless we're lucky. Um, so, so from these trajectories, so this might be somebody playing an Atari game, many Atari games over and over and over. We can create a training set um, of all the observations and actions that we observe. Right, so every dot here is some state or observation, and then we had an action. And so our training set is just going to be a set of these pairs of states and actions. Okay? So, uh, so you could recognize this as a uh, standard supervised learning training set that has examples that have you know, the inputs and the desired output. And you have a whole bunch of these pairs. You might have millions of them. And uh, we can then send it to one of our learning algorithms for classifiers and try to minimize the error, get a classifier with minimum error. Right? So is this part clear so far? Right, you're creating a training set. So, so the question is, if you, if you do that, you create this training set, and then you uh, learn a classifier, it's going to achieve some sort of error rate, right? testing error rate. Uh, what can you say about the policy that you get? in terms of how well it actually does in the environment. Because there's two different types of, you know, there's two things going on here. So one is we get a classifier, we have this fixed set of data, and it gets some error rate on the data. Uh, but that error rate, we would hope, somehow relates to the performance of the policy when you actually run it. But we have, there's not a clear, direct relationship that we've talked about so far. Right. So there's performance on the training data, but then if you actually run the policy, how well does it do? And there's one basic bound here. I'm not going to show you the proof, but it's, uh, I'll give you some intuition behind it. Um, but but you know, this is a basic result that's stated in various forms in various places. But what it says is if you learn a policy pi that has error epsilon, and this is error with respect to the target. So if you run the target policy, pi star, and then uh, you ask the R classifier to make predictions about the target policy's uh, action along those states, what's our error rate? Right? What fraction of the times does our policy disagree with the expert? And that's what epsilon is. So if we have a learned policy that has error rate epsilon um, with respect to the distribution of states generated by the expert, then our performance is going to be 
well, you might consider this to be close to the performance of the expert. Um, and so what does this mean? It means we're going to be at least as good as the expert minus this factor here, right? And so as epsilon goes to zero, as our error goes to zero, right, it, this says that we're going to be at least as good as the expert, right? Because this term, this term here goes to zero. Um, does that make sense? Kind of makes sense, right? So, so we know if you exactly copy the expert, you're going to do exactly as well as the expert. Um, and that would be an error rate of zero. And if you're a little bit worse than the expert, well, there's going to be some, some cost to pay um, if you're comparing yourself to the expert. And that, that cost is this term here. And you know, we'll, we'll talk about h squared, whether we think that's big or small um, in a moment. But... Uh, so this, this, is a, this is sort of a bound on performance, right? That relates our ability to learn classifiers to the ability to uh, control an environment. Now, so this is sort of, so you can interpret this as good news in the, in the sense that it sort of has the qualitative behavior we want. But, uh, but you can also interpret it as bad news as well because you can also show that the same sort of the, the reverse of that bound uh, is sort of a tight bound. So, so this previous one shows you that, you know, you're in, in general, you're going to do uh, close, you're going you're gonna to be this close, epsilon h squared close to the, the target policy. But, you know, maybe, maybe this is a loose bound because, you know, the, the analysis was loose. But uh, you can show it's a tight bound, in fact, um, in the sense that, you can create problems, you can create imitation learning problems where your performance is not going to be any better uh, than the expert minus this factor, right? So this is, you can create these specific examples that show uh, the worst case performance can, it can actually be this bad. Um, and H squared can be really large, right? That's sort of one of, the, one of the big points here. So H is the horizon that we're thinking about could be a hundred, could be a thousand. So H squared is big. And that implies that in order to make this term small enough so that your actual performance is close to that of the expert, you have to have a very, very tiny error rate, uh, which means that, which, which may not be practical in, in a lot of cases. Um, so, so this is sort of the, the bad news, I guess, that, that you can, can uh, take away from uh, this, this type of bound. So, so it's, it's very illustrative to try to try to understand why why this is the case, right? So, so basically, um, let us let's look at this little example. So, so let's suppose that this is the training data, right? So I'm just showing you a trajectory. All these blue dots are uh, are options that the expert policy did not select. So there were options that were there, but the expert policy selected the red options. And this is just showing you one trajectory, okay? And you, you would have a lot of these trajectories in the training data. I'm just showing you one. But now, uh, now you're going to train your classifier, okay? And uh, so you've learned a policy, and you're hoping it's going to exactly replicate the expert. And we see that for the learn policy on this first step, it did exactly replicate the expert, right? And so we're, we're okay. On the second step, though, um, since, since all the learn policies are going to have some error rate, right, they're going to have some error rate always. Uh, here we see the uh, the learn policy sort of uh, deviated from the expert's action, and so there was an error. And if you if you have enough steps, if you have a hundred or a thousand steps, even a small error rate, you're going to depart from the expert, you know, at least once with, with high probability. And so once you depart. Um, you may end up in states that are very far away from states that you've been trained on, and that can be a, that can be a problem. Um, so, you know, once you uh, make an action that's different from the expert, you end up someplace, and this place could be different from anything you've experienced in the training data because the training data was only on the expert trajectories. Yes. So just to be clear, if uh, it ends up in a state, for example, the expert was never in, would that mean that all possible actions would be considered error actions? 
You mean, uh, well, so, so the export policy is well-defined for any state. And uh, basically what this is is, a, is, is how well does your training distribution over states match your testing distribution? And our testing distribution is when we run the learn policy. And so when you run the learn policy and you end up at a, a place that's not um, from the expert, it can sort of deviate and get into states that are not represented in the training data. And if, a, if these states are not represented well in the training data, we can't really say anything about the accuracy guarantee. So our, our accuracy guarantee or our error rate is with respect to the data distribution, the state distribution of the, uh, the target policy. And so, you know, so, so th this sort of idea first, this sort of type of error first materialized way back in the, in the uh, it was maybe the uh, early 90s when, when people were starting to try to train self-driving cars and they weren't very successful then, but using imitation learning. And so what you would find is the, the self-driving cars, they saw this behavior after they were trained, they would sort of very slowly veer off the road. Right, which was kind of mysterious because you know humans, the, the, the training data didn't show that. But uh, but what would happen is you know there would be a little bit of error between the uh, the learned controller and what the human did, and that would uh, you know move it a little bit further than what the human was typically driving. Right, so you would be a little closer to the edge of the road, and that state's a little bit strange compared to what the human was usually uh, experiencing and what we saw in the training data, and so the classifier had a little bit more error and it would veer a little bit more out. And pretty soon you're in, you're like halfway, you know, off the road, um, you know, over that, that lane. And you're seeing, you're seeing data that you never saw in the training data because the human never was like halfway, you know, off the road. And so, uh, so then, then the classifier that was learned has no idea and you would have to get lucky for it to do the right thing. Right. And so, uh, so that, that's that's a real uh, that's sort of the real life example that sort of exhibits this, and, and this this actually you know you, you'll see this happening. Uh, not it's not not too uncommon uh, when you're when you're doing imitation learning. All right. So uh, so does that make sense? Like that, that's really one of the fundamental points that you want to know when you're talking about imitation learning. The learn policy may end up getting into states that are not represented well by the state distribution it was trained on or the state distribution of the expert. Because the expert knows what they're doing and they kind of stay in a good space and uh, they, they know how to recover from mistakes. Right? So if a human veers off a little bit, they'll recover very quickly. All right. So, uh, so the question is, how do you overcome this? Right? So, so if it is a problem, how do you overcome it? Um, well, basically, uh, the only way to really overcome it is to uh, learn from these deviations, right? So, so just like a human, you know, if you're if you're learning to drive, you just don't watch somebody drive and then try to imitate them. Uh, if you're learning a game, you just don't watch them play a game and then try to imitate them. You actually have to play, right? For some reason, it seems that actually doing the thing is important for learning well, right? I mean, you've all, all experienced this. You can't just watch somebody do a math problem, a bunch of math problems, and and successfully uh, you know solve them on tests. You have to go home and do the homework and do it yourself. And so, what's going on there? Well, you're you're probably going down some dead ends, and you're having to uh, figure out how to recover, right? Uh, when, when you're driving yourself, you have to uh, figure out how to recover from little deviations. And that's sort of the, the same type of uh, idea that's used uh, uh, to, uh, to recover from this, this failure mode of imitation learning. And th this idea has been around in a lot of different forms. Uh, so, so how do you address this error propagation? Um, so, so several... Uh, yeah, and, and well, actually, yeah, I want to spend just a minute to explain why, give you intuition of why there's an H squared here, right? So it, it would be a lot nicer to have H there, right, than, than H squared. Um, 
So, so basically what happens is uh, after you've learned a policy, let's say that you, you're going to now run it, right? Uh, there are H opportunities to make a mistake, right? So, so there are H independent opportunities over the horizon to depart from the expert. And once you depart from the expert, uh, you can't put any bound on how bad you might do after that, right? So, so in, in this analysis, you bound the maximum reward to be one. And so, uh, so you, you could get zero every time instead of one every time. So, so you can't bound how bad you'll do after an expert, uh, after you depart from the expert. And so let's just say that, that that worst case difference between you and the expert is H, right? You know, if you make a mistake at you know, H over two step, then you know, there'll just be a max difference of H over two going forward. But, uh, but as an upper bound, the max uh, difference between you and the expert after an error is gonna be H um, in, in reward. And so, uh, so the number, the expected number of mistakes along a trajectory is going to be uh, epsilon times h, and and then uh, each one of those will will give you a bound. You, you could do as bad as a as a as a h loss compared to the expert. So that's how you sort of get uh, the h squared there, right? So you have lot, you have sort of h opportunities to make an error, and if you make an error, then your loss could be as big as h. And you can do the, the more detailed summation calculations, and but you'll always have an H squared there. Though you, know, you might have, uh, you know, this you might have uh, it might be smaller than H squared by some constant factor, um, uh, but uh, but the H squared is is sort of fundamental. All right, so how can we overcome this? So so all of these techniques, uh, and, and I'm, we're going to talk about a particular one called dagger. Which is, which is really simple. Um, basically, look at the original data. So this is the original training data and you, you learn a policy from it, just using a classification learner. And then you're gonna actually run that policy, okay? So you're gonna run that policy. And this is like uh, if you were using it to control a car, well, you run it and maybe it's sort of veering off the road, right? Because it made that little error. Uh, but what you're going to do now is you're going to now ask the expert what the expert would do in every one of these situations. So you're sort of doing the task yourself, and then you're asking for advice about, well, should I have done that, or was there something that you would have done differently? Um, and so uh, the expert labels all of these by their choice, and then you pass all of this data into a new learner uh, to get a new policy, right? And then you would... Uh, Go ahead and run this new policy again, generate data from it, and get the expert to label that data, and then you put it all together. So you aggregate all this data together. So that's a, that's the basic idea. So is there any questions about that? No? It's a, you know, this is sort of the, the pseudocode for it, for this DAGGER, data set aggregation. That's what DAGGER stands for. Um, so repeat until you're done. So, so you initialize with some just standard imitation learning. You generate uh, a set of uh, D, uh, you set, generate a, a set of examples from N trajectories, um, and then you just repeat the following. So you learn your classifier, uh, you collect states that you see when you run that classifier uh, as a policy, and then uh, for each of those, you ask the expert to label those states and you throw them in your data set. And this data set grows and grows and grows every time you learn a policy, right? You learn a new policy um, and you just keep on adding to the data. And uh, then you return the final policy at the end. And there's, there's some, some theoretical results about this algorithm uh, that, that are, they're, they're in a, framework called no regret learning. Uh, the worst case can still be, you can still have that H squared, but there are, there are other cases where you go from H squared to H um, in terms of that error term. And, and those are the cases where, uh, so, so a lot of problems like the driving problem, if you depart from the expert policy, it's easy to recover usually, right? It's just a slight, slight change. Like you, you get veer off a little bit and you can steer back. 
And for those types of problems, you can characterize how recoverable a domain is. And uh, for those problems, you go from H squared to H. But in the worst case, if it's a domain where you can fall off a cliff, um, when you make just one single mistake, then you, you will have the H squared sort of necessarily. Uh, so that's sort of how the theory goes. Um, so, so what one issue here is each iteration increases the amount of training data, and that that's good in a sense, but it can also be pretty costly as if you do this for many iterations. And so there are sort of online versions of this approach that you just you know, update once based on the new data and you, you don't store this giant batch of data. Um, you, it's more like a stochastic gradient descent approach. And it, it works out pretty well uh, you know, as far as what I've seen um, in practice. So you don't necessarily have to collect this giant set of data that continues to grow, but, but you can. Um, so uh, yeah, if you, if you look at this paper, this is actually a reasonable paper. Um, some of the early experiments, this is before the days of uh, deep nets even, and uh, uh, before the days of where, where deep nets really took off and uh, pe before the Atari ALE uh, system was actually available. Uh, so they, they were actually experimenting in this, uh, this, this is some, I don't know what game system it is, but it's Mario Kart. And uh, they were actually using a neural network, uh, uh, to a non-convolutional neural network to control this car uh, using imitation learning. And uh, you can see this is what you get if you do Dagger. If you just do the pure supervised learning approach where you just generate data from the human, try to learn, uh, you end up doing something uh, like this because uh, this is a domain where you can slowly veer off from the... Uh, the human's trajectory um, and into areas that, that you're you're not familiar with. So this is this is one example, and the dagger has been used in a lot of uh, contexts uh, since then. Um, I think. Let's see. Yeah. So so when we look at this, though, I mean, when we think about this particular example. Does Dagger seem like a fairly awkward thing to use to generate data for an example like for a problem like this? Like, what do you? Got? So, so the first round, how do you collect data? Like, you, you would have uh, one of you who's really good at this game just play the game, right? You collect the data, you give it to the network uh, or whatever policy form you're learning. And you get a policy. Then that policy controls. Now, how are you going to get that data labeled? Right, the, the policy is going to now play the game. Does it seem difficult to label that data for a problem like this? I mean, what, what would you have to do? What would be an interface that you would have to build? Take a snapshot of the frame whenever the agent makes a decision other than the expert player, then label it right or left. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you, you don't know what the expert player would do because like, if I'm if you're the expert player, right, and, and now the computer is playing, we, we don't have your action choices at every step even, right? So, so we don't know uh, we we don't have a functionalized form of your policy. We just have sort of you who is controlling the joystick. Um, but you could take a snapshot, and you could ask, well, what would you do right now? Right, but but these snapshots are very like for a control task like this, continuous control task. It would be very awkward, right? To like, okay, here's a snapshot of the car. Like the human is, you know, is going to be able to drive nicely, sort of in the context, like the continuous flow of things. But if you just show a snapshot, they might be able to say, okay, I should go that way or this way. But it would be very awkward, and there's very many steps as well. Uh, so yeah, so I, I asked uh, I asked him how they actually did this because I was always a little confused about this and I guess what they did is they this is, it's a little bit strange but I guess it worked out so they they had the uh, agent the the learn policy play the game and they had a human with a joystick that would sort of pretend they're playing the game and so you're watching the agent play and you're using the joystick. So if the agent veered off this way, you're, you would 
you know, inevitably push the joystick this way, but uh, then the agent, you know, you're not going to see the control actions actually influence the game. So it was a fairly awkward type of interface, but that's that's how they did it. Um, so so it apparently worked here. Um, for higher level decisions, if you're doing reinforcement learning for higher level decisions at a lower frequency, then you can sort of ask the human, okay, what would you do here? You know, so in a in you know a board game or something like Go, uh, you could get get advice from a human much more easily. But for low level control tests, it's not clear always how how you will, how you apply this technique. Uh, so that's just something to think about. There's definitely user interface issues here. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the theory basically all, all says that to do imitation learning, or sometimes this is called apprenticeship learning, um, you've got to have the learning agent be active at some point, and not just a passive observer. Um, that's what this theory points to. Um, and, and it sort of agrees with what we our intuition about human learning, right? You can't just be a passive learner. You've got to be active and, and do things to, to really learn well. All right, so, so imitation learning requires that we have a good policy. And so how do we get a good policy? Well, one is to treat humans as the policy. Um, and that's what they did for the AlphaGo system. We'll be talking about that later in the class when we do Monte Carlo tree search. But they uh, just looked online and found expert games of Go and treated those as the, the expert policy. And you know, it's a little bit shady in terms of uh, like theoretical, uh, theoretical uh, properties because these games are from different people and there was probably no single expert policy that covers all of them. But, uh, but yet this seemed to work okay. Um, so, uh, so that's one place you, using, uh, you could use a human to move a robotic arm right? uh, or to drive a car. Um, and this is what we just talked about. Dagger can be awkward sometimes, especially for those lower level control tasks um, that, that you know, a human would have to interact with. Uh, the other approach, which is, uh, which this is something that we've done a lot in my, my, uh, with my students over the years in different domains, um, is to take a slow search algorithm, like a, a planning algorithm. We, we haven't really learned about those uh, as much and to uh, use it to solve the problem uh, and use that to, to generate data. So this could be, for example, let's just take the game of chess uh, if you have, or, or Go. You can use a very, you, know, you can use a search procedure that takes a lot of time each position to make a decision, right? So it's going to build a giant tree and you could have it take as much time as you want. It could take five minutes or, or an hour. Um, and the more time you give it, the better the decision. And what you'd like to do in a lot of these situations is be able to get the same quality of decision, but much faster. So, uh, so you'll run this slow search algorithm or this slow policy uh, and have it play many games and it'll take a lot of time. But then you use that as a way of collecting training data um, to learn a very fast policy. Just a neural network that zip comes to an answer. And in this case, you can actually do the dagger thing pretty well because you have an automated expert. Right? You can give it any state and ask what it would do. Um, and just as an illustration, this is an old illustration of, of this from Atari. Um, oh, oh we're, we're way over time. I don't know how that happened. Um, OK, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll finish this when we get back. But uh, we will uh, see you on Wednesday.